Hello, we're glad you found us. I'm Pastor Brady and this is St. Philip Online, where today and every day we're all about Jesus, that all may know him, love him, and share him. As we prepare together for this time of online worship, we invite you to please silence your cell phones or digital devices. Take a few deep breaths to prepare your heart and mind for worship. And then let's begin our sacred time together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil our way. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope Like wildfire in our very souls Holy Spirit, come invade us now We are your church We need your power in us We seek your kingdom first We hunger reading for today, which we'll hear in just a moment. The Apostle Paul finds himself in Athens, Greece, and he's addressing an assembly of people who love to meet and gather regularly to talk about the news and the happenings of the day. 
Paul says, I can tell you're very religious, but you don't know the God who created you and cares for you. Let me tell you about him. That's a good reminder for us. As we're constantly talking about the challenges of the day, as we talk ourselves about what's on the news, as we consider what we've lost, as we think about the blessings we've discovered in this time, we can often take our eyes off of God or forget that the God who made heavens and the earth still is in control and still is caring for us. Let's quiet our hearts and minds as we leave our griefs, our fears, our worries, our sins with God and are reminded again of that healing relationship and his Son, our living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our first reading from Acts chapter 17, verses 22 through 31. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious, for as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of you. In him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we might not think that the divine being is gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and an imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all raising him from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. When you think about the wind, we usually think about the things that the wind affects when it catches your hair or when you're looking at the trees blowing in the wind and it catches the leaves. We think about the wind and the Holy Spirit on Pentecost where the wind blew through the house and brought with it his power as he filled the people there. The Holy Spirit is like a filling wind that comes into our lives. And if we're like a balloon, we want to be filled by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us his comfort and his presence in our lives, filling us with his presence and his calm that comes only from God. God fills us with his peace. His hope, his forgiveness and love is all for us to fill us. This balloon is not meant to be empty. It's meant to be filled, just like we're meant to be filled by the Holy Spirit. He gives us his presence in our lives and causes us to feel the calm and love of God. God wants us to know his presence and to be able to rely on him when things are difficult. He gives us his peace and fills us with himself. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. Revelation 3.20 Having that peace from the Holy Spirit sounds like a great thing, especially right now. How do we get that? Well, it's all a relationship with God, spending time with him, praying and reading his word, listening to Christian songs, 
reaching out to God when we need him. And he will fill us with his presence and with his peace. A reading from John chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live, and you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whomever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And who loves me is beloved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We heard in our last reading how Jesus, speaking to his followers before he went to the cross, was encouraging them, letting them know that he would not leave them alone, but they would experience his Father's presence and his presence too. That's a real comfort to us, because in the middle of the challenges of this COVID-19 experience and also some of the blessings of it, we can still find ourselves wondering, God, what are you doing? Please speak to me and show me what you're doing with me in the middle of all of this. God wants us to know and hear from him. Now, usually when God speaks, it's not an audible voice coming out of the blue, but 95% of the time, God speaks to us using his word. That's why it's so important to read the Bible or to hear it read, to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest it. Because when we ask for God to speak to us, most of the time the Holy Spirit will then bring to our remembrance or recall some word of promise that he's already shared. But if we haven't heard that word of God and had it stored on our spiritual hard drive, God can't bring that to our minds and hearts, which is why it's so important to read and hear the Bible. And then, once we've heard and being refreshed in the knowledge of God, we can pray every day, Holy Spirit, please show me what you're doing today and give me the courage to follow you into it. That is a dangerous prayer, and God will answer it and take you, perhaps, to some surprising and exciting places. I invite you to think about that in our next song for today, and then you'll hear a special message from one of the key leaders in our church. Ken is our head deacon. They oversee member care here at St. Philip, and I asked him to prepare and share this message a couple months ago. So we'll get to hear from him and from God's Word in just a moment. Let's sing God's praise together.
Thank you, Pastor Brady, and thank you, all of you who have joined me today to talk about Jesus, to learn new and amazing things about him, read scripture, and pray. What a pleasure it has been to serve as your head deacon at St. Philip Lutheran Church for the past several years. And what an honor and amazing journey it has been to work with you, Pastor Brady, on preparing this sermon. My hope is that this message will be as much of a blessing to all those who hear it as it was for me to deliver it. Can you imagine your life without relationships? Think about that for just a moment. A life without relationships would mean a life that didn't involve interacting with other people. A life that's completely independent, self-sufficient, answering to no one, not dependent on someone else, and no one dependent on you. Could such a life even exist, and even if it could exist, what would life be like? If I asked this question to a hundred people, I'm sure I'd receive many different and creative responses. On one extreme, some may say, a life without relationships would be highly rewarding, producing ultimate freedom, no strings attached, no judgment, or being judged, or the best definition of heaven on earth, and the ultimate solution to ending all evil in the world. After all, isn't the source of evil caused by what people do to each other? While others on a completely opposite spectrum would respond in saying that a life without relationships would be boring, unfulfilling, sad, isolating, worthless, and quite possibly the definition of hell itself. After all, what benefit would life bring if life itself couldn't be shared with others? A dear friend of mine, one who I have known for over 20 years, has suffered several life-altering experiences that have caused him and his family profound pain, some of which were caused by his own decisions while other experiences were caused by other people and outside of his control. The solutions to his problems, he says, is one that's heard many times today, which is to choose a life separate from society and to live off the grid. Have you heard that term used before by others or possibly read about it? To live off the grid means to live in a place where someone could build a remote lifestyle without any reliance on public utilities, people, or other common luxuries that we enjoy today. On the surface, this seems to be a reasonable option to someone who has been hurt deeply by other people like my friend. But when I ask my friend why he hasn't followed through with his decision, the primary reason he gives me is his fear of being isolated and unknown. The thought of being removed from the interactions and relationships of other people is greater than the pain he has experienced in life. In reality, everything we do as human beings in the normal daily operation and progression of our lives involves some level of interaction with each other, and we cannot escape the truth that within these interactions or relationships, we not only rely upon each other, but are relied upon. Have you personally experienced a change in your relationships because of the recent social distancing rules caused by COVID-19 pandemic? Perhaps there are relationships you miss because of the shelter in place rules that restrict you from being present with those you're close to, or perhaps your relationships have become strained as a result of living in confinement. My wife would be the first to tell you that ever since my employer implemented a work from home policy, it seems like our house has shrunk to the size of a small shoebox caused by my constant presence and persistent questions. Honey, where are my socks? Can I change the channel? Is dinner ready? I wonder what would happen if I lit this on fire. <laughs> uh, it's uh, not difficult to understand that relationships require a lot of energy and in many cases, patience and forgiveness. Just ask my wife. They are complicated, ever-changing and diverse. Even the interactions I have with a store clerk 
when buying groceries for the week is a relationship? Sure, it's a very simplistic interaction that only involves a brief exchange of money to buy needed food, but it is a relationship nevertheless. So with all this in mind, if you could identify one trait that you believe to be the most critical element in the most important relationship in your life, what would it be? Would you say communication, intimacy, chemistry, conflict resolution, understanding, mutual respect, or possibly trust? I am sure all of us would agree that each of these traits are important, and I'm sure we could add a few more to the list if given more time. In 2017, Psychology Today reported that a prominent university conducted two independent studies that involved over 25,000 adults from around the world. These adults were asked to rank the most important relationship traits that would lead to success and happiness. The results of these studies found that there are two critical traits that all of the other traits are dependent upon. The first trait is communication, and the second trait is knowledge. And it's knowledge within our relationships that I want to emphasize today. Without knowledge, how can any other trait flourish within a relationship? Knowledge requires learning about the other person, taking time to understand the unique qualities and nature of another person that is rooted in reality and truth, as evidenced by actions or inactions. Without a truthful understanding that leads to knowledge of the other person, trust cannot be built Respect has no foundation. Communication is restricted. And more importantly, love cannot be truthful. When reading the Old and New Testaments, it becomes clearly evident that all of Scripture is filled with dramatic and exciting relationships between God and His creation, each with a unique purpose designed by God to carry out His will in redemptive history. Even though the events of our lives can't be seen within the pages of Scripture, God is still active and working in our lives to bring us closer in relationship with Him. Or as we read today in Acts chapter 17, verses 26 through 27, And He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. What an amazing God we have. From within this passage, we learn that he has revealed himself as a personal God, one that is close to us, searchable, and desires a relationship with you and with me. Because God has introduced himself to his creation this way, we can now respond to him, know him, and pursue a relationship with him. It's not only through creation that God has revealed himself. He has also revealed himself in the person and work of Jesus Christ. For we read in 1 John chapter 5, verse 20, And we know that the Son of God has come, and has given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. All of the knowledge and understanding we have of God through Jesus Christ is because he has revealed himself to us. He has given us knowledge about himself. We now know him because he first knew us. Turning to our gospel reading for today in John chapter 14, we can see an amazing relationship between Jesus and his disciples as he comforts 
and prepares them for the traumatic events that would take place over the next few days. It's nighttime. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and Judas Iscariot has since left them to fulfill his plan to betray Jesus to the religious leaders. The disciples are overwhelmed with fear and sadness with the knowledge that Jesus will soon be beaten, whipped, subject to a mock trial, taken away from them, and then crucified. They are so distraught and unable to accept the reality that Jesus would not be with them soon. For we read in verse 1, chapter 14, Jesus said to them, Let not your hearts be troubled. The disciples relied on Jesus completely. You can imagine how difficult this must have been for them because Jesus was their everything, just like a child's relationship to his or her parents. Jesus fed them when they were hungry. He was their protector when the crowds became irate. He saved their lives when there otherwise wasn't any hope. He was their teacher, the source and purpose of their lives, and now he was going away. They left everything to follow Jesus, and now their everything was going away. But Jesus didn't stop there. And he continued to comfort them. He ties his leaving with the eventual union with him in the life to come. In verses 18 through 20, we read, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. As it was for the disciples, this should be equally comforting to us, because Jesus lays out the security and the knowledge of the gift of salvation and the coming of the Holy Spirit that would be given to them and then to his church, following his death and resurrection. Jesus lovingly reassures his disciples that by his going to the cross, he will not be leaving them as orphans. He will send the Holy Spirit who will be with them forever. Jesus' use of the term orphan had the same meaning to the disciples as we understand the term today. Through deeply unfortunate circumstances in life, Many children experience the death or abandonment of both parents, leaving them with little to no other options but to live their childhood life in an orphanage. Our understanding of the challenges, loss, and brokenness intimately familiar with orphans today was equally understood by those who lived in Jesus' day. Without the guidance and love from caring parents or from adoptive families, orphans often learn to depend on themselves the comfort of home and the security of permanence are foreign concepts. They hunger for relationships and the wounds that result from the loss of both parents are felt lifelong. Similarly, we find spiritual orphans today, people who are starving for a relationship with Jesus and don't know it. They don't know God or pursue any knowledge of him people who don't have a home in God's kingdom. They are in desperate need to be a part of God's family, are lonely and isolated. Although they have gained many or all the benefits the world has to offer, their achievements and wealth cannot replace what God offers, including salvation. They remain spiritually lost and with no hope. But for those who believe, all the promises that Jesus gave the disciples have been freely given to us to receive. Although we don't see him in bodily form today, we are given the promise that we will see him again in the life to come. And what a glorious day that will be. The promise of salvation rests entirely on the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and not on ourselves 
if Jesus did this for us as an unconditional extension of his love for us, how could we otherwise respond in any other way but by gratitude? This is the type of response Jesus was referring to regarding those who love him in verse 21. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Conversely, it's easy to interpret this passage in a way that would lead us to believe that we have a conditional relationship with Christ, whereby through obedience to his commandments we will establish a right standing before God, we might even say to ourselves, if I obey the commands of Jesus, then I will love him. To believe this way isn't interpreting or applying Jesus' teaching correctly. In fact, if we believe that we can learn to love Jesus through obedience to God's law, it will only lead us to despair, frustration, and separation from God because we cannot obey his law perfectly or even come close. The requirements of God's law are clear. That obedience is required 100% of the time in thought, word, and deed. For example, we read in Galatians chapter 3, verse 10, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Christ loves us and throughout his life, obeyed God's law perfectly. He went to the cross to save us, to restore our relationship with him by making us whole, clean, and acceptable to God as his children by faith. But the good news doesn't stop there. Christ continues to manifest himself to us throughout our lives, which changes us on the inside so that we can continue to grow in knowledge and love towards Him. This work within our lives is attributed to the Holy Spirit who works within us to produce the results that come from the relationship Jesus has established with us. Knowing that we have been forgiven, we can now begin to forgive others. Knowing that we have been loved, we can now love others, knowing that peace, patience, kindness, and gentleness has been extended to us by grace, we can now extend the same within the relationships we have with others, whether they are Christians or non-Christians. This is the fruit of the Holy Spirit that Paul was referring to in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. This work is not our own, but the work of the Holy Spirit, given to us as a gift, just as it was given to the disciples on the day of Pentecost. An excellent example of this was when I decided one Saturday afternoon to take a drive by myself, to get out of the house and see the sights. I was driving on the freeway. It was raining softly with occasional bursts of sunshine, which made it a perfect day to get out for a drive, at least initially. The drive was truly enjoyable until the clouds grew dark and it started raining very hard. But as anyone familiar with driving California freeways would know, the hard rain didn't deter drivers from driving recklessly, taking unnecessary risks and speeding past me as though I was standing still. I couldn't believe it. Despite the rain, cars were still dodging in and out of traffic, seemingly with no regard for the safety of others, and I grew really frustrated. The erratic driving around me seemed to only increase, and my frustration grew to the point where I actually muttered to myself, you know, if any of you get into an accident, I'm not going to stop to help. I said this with absolute resolve in my conviction. I was so frustrated. Not more than 15 seconds had passed after saying that when disaster happened. I saw 
only a few car lengths ahead of me, a small sports car lose control, spin out of control in front of two other cars, nearly colliding with both of them, then in a split second, dart across the freeway from one end to the other, slide down an embankment, completely out of sight, and then finally come to rest. I had no idea where the car had stopped, but I immediately pulled over to see what I could do to help. As I walked closer, I could see the driver's side window rolled down and a woman, still conscious, breathing heavily to the point where she was hyperventilating and unable to speak. I asked if she was okay, but because of her erratic breathing, she couldn't talk. Knowing the comfort that can come from a simple touch, I asked if I could touch her arm and told her no one was hurt and that she would be okay. She said yes, and with my continued assurance, standing in the pouring rain, she began to calm down until the paramedics and the police arrived. This experience, although traumatic, is a relationship too, centered around an event that will likely be remembered by both of us for different reasons for as long as we live. Now, it's important to know that I'm not sharing this experience with you to show what a good guy I am. Not at all. In fact, I want to emphasize the immediate change in mind I had that I attribute entirely to the work of the Holy Spirit. If left to myself and my negative thoughts, I would have continued in my frustration, continued driving on my way without offering help to a neighbor in need. Instead, I had a change in mind that was focused on another motive that wasn't my own, which was based on my love for our Lord, my relationship with Him, and desire to obey Him and His commandments, not as a means to gain a righteousness of my own or to receive forgiveness for past sins or to not make God angry. No, it was simply a love response I had towards someone else in need because of my relationship with Jesus. Now, it's equally true, however, that other people could and do help people unselfishly in many other similar situations, but with a variety of different motives that may not be Christ-centered, such as to receive karma, or I did it because that's how I was raised, or I would want someone else to help me if I was in the same situation, and the list goes on. But for those who have responded to the gospel, have a genuine relationship with Jesus, a love and trust in Christ, then their motives change. Decisions become Christ-focused, and as a result, have a natural and sincere desire to obey his commands and to follow him. This is what Jesus meant when he said, as recorded in John 14, verse 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So I urge you, everyone, to seek Christ and pursue a relationship with him, whether you are a Christian or a non-Christian, to love Jesus. My hope is that you will press on toward the goal for the prize that you have been called by God in Jesus Christ, to increase in the knowledge and understanding of Jesus and his sacrificial atonement for your sins, so that you will be led to love to know peace, and to serve him more. Despite all of life's challenges and rejections that we experience, he will not leave you as orphans. He will care for you, guide you, and sustain your faith in him all the days of your life. And all of God's grateful children said, Amen. Now let us confess together our shared faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We're so glad you found us online at St. Philip, a community of people who love Jesus and those around us. And a special thank you as we get going for those who've been extremely active ever since the stay-at-home order came down, still where they are serving Christ and those around us. A special shout-out to our worship, deacon, property, and kids club teams. Just want to let you know what they've been doing for Christ for example, our Kids Cub School Care Team has been meeting online still with their students each and every week, including students who don't know Jesus. Their work wraps up this week, led by Vonnie and Becca. Well done, everyone. Also, our property team, led by Lon Dayton, has been extremely busy. This is a great time to repaint and restore and rebuild the campus, for the time when we're able to meet again. And we've been extremely busy. You're going to be thrilled when you come back. Well done, everyone. And thank you for those who continue to volunteer. Likewise, our deacons are now meeting every week and calling and connecting with people each and every day. They also sent out the recent mailings to all our ministry partners that were so well received. Nicely done. And finally, our worship team. Ten-plus people each and every week work on and prepare our worship services for you, led by Marilyn Harry, our team leader. Well done, everyone. We can serve others so generously because we're in God's Word and served by Jesus. Our largest group in the Bible meets each and every Sunday. If you haven't tried it out, please join us, our Connect Time, on Sundays. But God is nudging us that it may be time for more of us to get into God's Word. Zoom is a great method to invite people all over the nation to connect and maybe read a new book of the Bible together. If that interests you and you'd like to help launch or be part of a group that reads through a book of the Bible, perhaps either with Becca or myself or with someone else, please allow us to help set that up. Call or text me at this number, 925-549-0589, and we'll get you started. Please also reach out if you're interested in talking about God's gift of Holy Communion. We recently received a supply of cups just like these with hygienically sealed wafer and juice all in one so that you can receive Holy Communion individually, perhaps, if you'd like and be interested in talking about how you can receive Holy Communion safely and in a comfortable way for you, please also call or text me. I'll be glad to serve you as well. We're continuing to serve and plan together how to better serve our community. So our voters meeting on June 7th is a great way for you to be involved online. There are new items of news and new blog posts each and every week on our website. And as the Holy Spirit moves you, please give generously through an envelope or online at stphilipchurch.com. Now let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught all his followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
I invite you as you look around at this beautiful world and the sunshine and the spring, as you take walks this week, to reflect on the God who made heaven and earth, who wants you to know him and be renewed in your relationship with him. Consider spending a little more time in prayer or in God's word. If you'd like to read the Bible, perhaps anew with a group online, let us know. And then renewed in that knowledge and relationship, we can go and be even more of a blessing in a safe way to those around us. And we go in God's name and with his love on us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's sing his praise together one more time. Jesus, Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.